We are so excited to be welcoming um, Masa Sasaki today, who is a just incredibly skilled artist, and we're so excited to have his work in our shop. I, I understand we'll be getting even more work from him in the next couple of weeks. So before we start with that introduction, um, I want to make sure everybody knows that we've just recently announced that April 9th, Saturday, April 9th, is the grand opening of the new building. So we hope that we will see you all there if you're able to join us. Um, it is just incredible to, how close we are and to walk around that building and think about how different, um, how many amazing benefits we will get um, and that we will be able to serve more people and um, create community in ways we never really dreamed of or were able to, well, we dreamed of them, but we weren't able to do before. So please join us on that day. Um, we also want to, I'm gonna turn on the transcription services here for anyone who is interested. We wanna recognize that the Clay Studio stands on the indigenous territory known as Lenapahawking, which is the traditional homeland of the Lenni Lenape people. We reflect on the need to be stewards of the land as the Lenape are and have been for many generations. Again, thank you to Masa and I will um, give you a little background. And then of course, we're gonna start with our favorite question about why he got into art in the first place. Masayuki Sasaki is a classically trained artist with multifaceted interests. He is an accomplished pianist, award-winning painter, and uniquely stylistic potter. Since moving from his native Japan in the late 1980s, he has impressed teachers, patrons, and his fellow artists with his unique sense of precision and artistic vision. We live in a world where we are surrounded by machine-made and mass-produced goods today. I feel, as a contemporary craftsman, the need to validate the value of handmade items by making things that could not easily be duplicated and are unique to my own artistic perspective. So, oh, and then the last statement, which I love is, um, I desire most of all that the usefulness and aesthetic appeal of this art be both easily perceived and lasting. And I, you can really tell that um, Masa makes everything to be universally beloved and that it's timeless. We can really see that in your work. So thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you all for coming to this Zoom conversation. I'm very excited. Okay, I guess I will talk about how I started this career. It was not really all that intended at first, but um, let's see, where should I start? Maybe I should start from where, when I came to the United States. I grew up in Japan till high school years, and then I decided to become a foreign exchange student. I begged my parents and they allowed me to go after that. And then um, I kind of grew up in Japan as pretty normal childhood, I would have to say. But then um, I was really influenced by my grandmother a lot. So like a lot of um, pottery, she was a, a great pot pottery collect collector there. And then every time I visit her, then I would just listen to her describe like, you know, her collections, what is so great about it and stuff like that. That's pretty much what was in my childhood as far as like artistic influence in pottery. But for other things like drawing some paintings, I always really loved doing stuff like that. But um, let's see, but Japan is not exactly a country, especially in the countryside like I'm from, um, the art is not really encouraged. Math and science is more encouraged. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I wasn't quite feeling it because I thought those are not, not my forte. And then um, there was an opportunity for me to apply for a foreign exchange student program. So I decided to go. And then this organization chose me to go to Buell, Idaho, a very small town, it's a population of like three, 4,000 in the whole town. 
where I'm coming from is Fukuoka city. And that is like, almost like Atlanta. The population is like, what? 5 million or something like that. Maybe a little bit less at the time, but it's um, one of the major cities in Japan. And then um, I came to Idaho and everything was just a total shock to me because the language was new. Um, I was almost like a toddler because I couldn't communicate with no one. My English wasn't so good. And um, writing and reading was okay. But as far as like conversational English, that wasn't there. So I had to learn from like pretty much from scratch. But then uh, what encouraged me there a lot is the, the, my ability to be able to draw and play the piano and stuff like that. And then that, that's how I pretty much made my close friends that are still in contact today. But that, that really encouraged me to go into art. And then um, I kind of flourished there in high school and then decided to go to community college and that's where I took my first pottery lesson. So I didn't learn um, how to make pots in Japan, but here I learned it. And I immediately fell in love with it because throwing pots and putting a design on it, surface design is almost like stretching your own canvas and then putting a drawing on a 3D surface. That's how I saw it. And Still to this day, that's pretty much how I um, think of my parts. Mm. And after that, um, let's see. Well, this is going to be a too long of a conversation. I'm going to give you a condensed version. My dad, who was a country musician, moved from Japan because he was uh, very encouraged that his son was in Idaho, in America, and he wanted to become a country musician here. So he came to Nashville, Tennessee to pursue his career. And then he wanted me to move there. So I did from Idaho to Nashville, Tennessee. Um, a little more exciting. <laughs> yeah, a little <laughs> more exciting, but it's very different from, um, it's almost like a foreign country from where I lived in Idaho to Nashville, because Nashville is like Southern city. And, you know, it's very different from small town in Idaho. So that was a culture shock in itself there too. But then there was, um, I, I pursued my um, art and continue to do so. And then um, I attended Western Kentucky University and that's where I met Michelle Cox, that was my professor. And then she just was the, one of the greatest um, teachers I ever met. And she pretty much influenced me in the direction that I am here today. Mm -hmm. And after that, I moved to Atlanta, Georgia and forgot all about art art and then pursued my business career, which is a um, vintage clothing wholesaler. Um, believe it or not, like vintage clothing, like old clothes from like 1950s, 60s were such a big thing in Japan. And then I was exporting those for years. And then, um, you know, um, but when you're doing stuff like that, it's fun and okay, but then, you have this drive to create something artistic, which is undeniable. And then I realized there's a studio here, a pottery studio in town. So I decided to attend that studio at nighttime, start throwing pots and making things. And then I just felt so at home. And then I started to create more and more. And then when you create more pots, what happens is that you're gonna run out of place to put your pots and then run out of um, people to give gifts to because they get eventually they get tired of receiving pottery all the time from you. So, and then you have to venture out yourself to the uh, local art festivals and, you know, things like that. So I, that's what I did in the beginning. Mm -hmm. I did like, you know, spring festive, spring art festivals or and things of that nature. And then I started to sell pots. But then what she realizes is what she makes is not gonna necessarily sell out there. Yeah. And then you have to adjust your style. Well, I, what I used to do is um, I liked surface design back then too, but then um, 
it was more subtle because I really like that Japanese Zen kind of simplicity. And people at the festival not necessarily like that kind of simplicity. It's kind of high art. So I had to kind of uh, incorporate more colors to my parts. And then the things that started to move. And then it's just that kind of feedback to me was very essential. And then you do have like a conversation with your, um, you know, people at the festival that buys your part. And then you just listen to them and then reflect onto your parts sometimes. Mm -hmm. So there's like that uh, balance there that, you know, like you start to realize what sells well, what doesn't sell good. And then you just kind of have to sell because in order to make more parts, then you have to support that hobby. So that's how I did. And then in the meantime, I was getting some contacts from local galleries, restaurants, plant store, all these places that wanted me to custom make their stuff. So that was very um, essential for my career, I think, mm -hmm. because I still keep in touch with those people and then I still make them on the side. But what was important to me was the galleries though, because they have their collection, I mean, uh, uh, collectors and you know clientele that really, really love pottery. And then those are the ones that I'm beginning to cater to more and more. Yeah. So that's pretty much how um, I started my pottery business. And then it's just keep growing every year, seems like. Oh, that's amazing. And there's so, so many things that you touched on that I want to ask questions about. Sure. Um, totally unrelated to your pottery. Are you still doing the vintage clothing stuff? I am um, beginning to not to do that anymore because I just don't have time now. Yeah, because I'm in my studio pretty much day and night. So wow. I don't, I don't, although I enjoy that aspect of my life because it's totally different from what I do. So that's kind of refreshing. So maybe still, if you find that, like, whatever the pinnacle of the highest thing that people want. I don't know, 1950s um, yeah, leather some, motorcycle something jacket. Like that. You could still yeah, exactly. <laughs> do that. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. so interesting. And then I can't not easily just, you know, disregard years of connections and you know what I mean? Yeah. So you have to taper off slowly and then transition into, you know, totally full-time potter, which I am already, but um, yeah. even more so. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> there's full-time and then there's like full-time plus... 10 or something um right do you think that your work in working with kind of that vintage style stuff did that affect your aesthetic at all for your pottery do you yeah think because um I, I feel that like a lot of things are just related okay for instance um when I look at the clothes and then they request certain kind of clothing. So that could be like the pattern of the fabric or you know the design or the shape of it, which can be kind of applied to you know the things that I make too. I, I consider surface design almost like a fashion design too. What goes well, yeah. you know, with this shape or mood. Absolutely. And the I find some of the work that you I, for one, we're going to look at your your images in a few minutes, but there's something about the kind of mid-century, there was a, in the design world, there was a biomorphic, uh, a love of the kind of biomorphic form because of the space program. People were really interested in kind of aliens and the futuristic thing. And I feel like there's something something in that in your work as well. But the, the patterning, for sure, I love the way you talked about it as as related to fashion that you're trying to get the form and what looks best, what pattern looks best on that form. Mm -hmm. um, and then when you were noting that you, your original work was very simple <clears throat> and then it kind of became more colorful and more complex in response to where you were doing shows and having feedback, immediately I thought, I wonder if that's regional because here in Philadelphia, we often, we do sell things that are colorful. And I mean, obviously your work flew off the shelves in the shop, but we also have people who come in and like all they want is something that's just black and like really simple. So I wonder oh, if, wow, okay. if, 
in you know, in, in Atlanta in the south maybe is that I don't know I'm just thinking about the possibilities there are kind of different um regional preferences for like different kinds of things mm -hmm. and as you were saying you're sort of more going towards the idea of selling work through galleries and finding those collectors who are kind of ceramic collectors I wonder if you'll actually find yourself kind of looping back to some of that more simplified work because there are collectors we have who like who like simple monochromatic things and you'll be able to kind of have both of those things in your stylistic arsenal I don't know I'm just I, I do have a different style. Um, let, me, let me show you. <clears throat> like, I do make very simple pots like this. You see? Yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. And it's so, and then, you know, um, on the other hand, like more design here for my honey pot. Mm -hmm. So there, there's a category of things that I make for different audience. You know what I mean? That's exactly what I'm saying, right? You have like okay. kind of different audiences exactly. and you can make different kinds of work for them, which is mm -hmm. so smart and then this, to have that. This is sort of like a, you know, strategy because I was in kind of um, different kind of business um, um, all through my life. So you learn different things from there and then you can incorporate that skills into your pottery too. I mean, this is detail oriented, right? Time consuming. Mm -hmm. Time consuming, it really is. But this is much less. So people who who can uh, who is not a pot, big pottery collector or anything, they can go for this kind of you know more simplified ideas with a more you know lower price point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and the fact that you have that business background too, like you're saying, it's so important to understand how to incorporate that into your artwork in a way that you're mm -hmm. still true to your artistic vision, but you need to sell your work. And so you can have these different um, versions. I, I'm teaching a business practices and craft to undergrads at Tyler School of Art. And there are a lot of mm -hmm. ceramics people. Um, and I, I'm trying to impress upon them that you really need to be a business person if you want to be an artist. That's the only way you can make a living. Make more art is if you sell stuff, right? Yeah, I mean, you, my, my thing is you just have to support yourself as a, as a living artist. So, you know, that's, that's the way. Well, you, you can always, you know, like, like I did in the beginning, just do some other stuff. Like during school, I was um, waiting table and, you know, um, buying art supplies and stuff like that um, you know you can sustain it yourself but if you want to make that a career you have to make your career with what you make yeah yeah absolutely well speaking of which how about if I share my screen and you can talk to us about how your work has evolved okay all right oh, there we go so you were telling me a little bit before about. Yes, that's the um, very simple beginning of the alien design. <laughs> and what made you, well, let's pause here. What made mm -hmm. you so interested in this alien guy? Um, it's almost like, um, you know, when I, I, was a, I was a painter as well too. So it's, it's like a sketching, just, you know, um brainstorming maybe just just a doodle you know and then I liked it and that's the only beginning of it yeah does it make sense yeah absolutely I mean he's very um cheerful but at the same time he can have different emotions by just like where you've placed his eye I don't know exactly I think it's a brilliant um uh design element that we know it's your work but it can have these different moods Mm -hmm. so yeah so and then that 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 shape becomes something else and then the surface design takes different um I, I i put a different approach to the surface design this is um three tiered jaws and and you're doing this with um some kind of resist no this is um actually um well, I, I like to use cookie cutters for my work. And then oh. every, anything that makes indentation. So I, I use exacto knife cookie cutters, um, like a old 
you know, if you go to Antique Store, you can find all these press, press print, print press blocks or something like that. Oh, yeah. The, anything that makes indentation, or you can go to a hardware store and find some screws or whatever that, you, that makes really interesting indentation. Mm -hmm. I, I use it a lot. So that becomes almost like my drawing tool. And then um, this one is just a, um, um, all the negative space, which is white there. And that's all I just, I just paint around the negative space with um, slip, the porcelain slip, yeah. And then that's it, pretty much. So it's all, you do the stamping and the images and then it's mm -hmm. all freehanded glaze. Ever. Exactly. And then oh. he, he, um, you see those red dots some here and there, those are just under glaze. Yeah, oh, that's great. So similar jar form, the lidded jar form, but I started to really like recessed jars, recessed lid, mm -hmm. because um, if you put the recessed lid on a horizon, horizontal surface, then the lid doesn't really show. And then when you get close to it and the lid is actually sunken in, I really like that surprise. That, does it make sense to you? Absolutely, that's a great. Mm -hmm. And and the the handle is almost just like a a hint. Yeah, oh, the offset handle is uh, you know it's it, it, when you start using that, it's somehow it's very logical. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I mean it's a a very um secure way to pick it up. Is that what you mean by logical? That it just it's really functional. Exactly, you can put one finger in there and then open it like that. Um, Raymond wants to know what kind of clay body you usually use. Um, I used to use this clay called Black Mountain. Over the years, they became Beige Mountain. So I switched to 710. Um, is that a standard clay, I think? I'm, I'm not sure. Um, I don't have a box here. <laughs> well, <laughs> later. Close yeah. enough, I think. Okay, so 710. I think it's standard clay. I bet I'm, one of our I'm people. Sorry if I'm wrong. We have standard at the clay studio. I bet one of our people can chime in and say whether that sounds right. Okay, please do. Yeah, so that's what I use. I, I love that clay. And it's very easy to throw with. So okay. the next one. So now, uh, uh, again, recessed lid with um, alien design there. And, uh, this and, time it's a lot more complicated because this is like few four years later or so from the first picture. Mm. And you have um, and you found a new use for that loop handle. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's a that's a good place to rest the spoon. <laughs> right, so I mean the, the the you know the spoon is kind of incorporated into the design as well too that way. Yeah. That makes so much sense. Um, and then you, I love these little tiny icons that you found too. I assume that they're maybe from those block printing that you were talking about. Uh, yes, they're, uh, they're, they come from Japan. There's a plastic letters, letter press set oh. that I bought a long time ago in Japan. Mm -hmm. And then that's what I used to um, mark those. But then uh, in the beginning, they didn't mean anything. But these days, there is some intentional meaning to those. Like on this one, is there intentional? Meaning? Yeah, well, you see the first mark is question. Yeah. Question plus the telephone symbol is like communication and then goes equal, like key to the luck. <laughs> well, <Wow>. you know. <laughs> wow, that's great. I love it. Yeah. Now I'm gonna- Four leaf clover is like a symbol of luck in Japan. I guess it's here too, right? Do, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So something like that. Um, yeah, if I if I can, um, yeah, like, um, can you see me now? I'm here. I'll stop my share so you're bigger. Okay, now you're big again. Okay. So now you see here, yep. right? Mm -hmm. In a cup form, it's easier to. And then, um, and then more and more, I was doing alien designs. I realized something that was about me that um, I'm a green card citizen here, and then the. Green card, in my green card, it says resident alien. And then I have an alien number, you see? So um, 
then I re realized maybe it was more about myself than just the alien design. So I decided to incorporate my first six digits of my alien card number oh. here. So, and then I just realized that, you know, um, the like a lot of us artists, we just don't fit in to normal, normal you know, like um, to what seems to be normal. So I feel like um, I'm pretty alien a lot of times. And then it just kind of symbolizes that too. So I'm, I'm really um, attached to this design now. That is so insightful. Thank you for sharing that with us. Okay, not only that, um, when you think of alien, there has to be something else there. So inside of the cup, there's an abductee. So there's a story there. Alien cup, capture the abductee at the bottom. When you finish your morning coffee, you save someone's life. So that kind of, uh, you know, like the happy kind of boost in the morning, to me, it seems like a cool way to start a day. So things like that goes into my design, you know? I love that you made it into this heroic, we have to start the day in a heroic <laughs> Exactly. State. How yeah. about the bottom? Can you show us the bottom too? Your... Yeah, it's, it's just that, you know, like I like to um, show that I care about the bottom too, you know, so, and then incorporate that into the design as well too. Yeah, yeah. Well, and then the whole thing is, is about care. You know, you're thinking about your yourself and your identity and you're thinking about giving that feeling of heroism to your to the user which is a way to care for those people too i mean it's really um i love that that echoes through and that you know someone can look at your piece and just think oh it's fun look how pretty it is and it's cheerful and then it has all this other meaning to it it's very special um there's some surprise yeah yeah let's see okay let me go back to oops, to share my screen again Okay. Okay, so we did this one. And then this is another um, yes. progression. It's the re recessed lid again. But then I, I started to put this, uh, what I call ball handle. It just, I don't think you can resist grabbing the ball and then try to open the lid. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good way. To it's a it. very, very physical piece. And then I think it has its appeal. It really does. When they're in person, it is amazing. Um, and here <laughs> we have a, another a friend for your alien. Um, and there's also some things that to me look like almost like DNA or definitely like molecules, maybe. I don't know. Am I, is that, am I just adding well, that on my own? I, I like that. I guess I could use that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it wasn't intentional. Yeah. But we have a, see, the ideas are like, friend. see, what I mean is like ideas is everywhere. Like when you say like DNA, oh my gosh, then it does look like that, right? I mean, what if I start making the coffee molecule patterns um, put onto a cup? This just comes into my mind right, right now, right? So to me, this is the process of creativity. Like someone says something or something I see on TV or some, you know, even my own work, what, what result is like looking at something and then you get something and then you try to put that onto your work. So I like that idea of molecule looking, you know, patterns. I like that very much. Great. Oh, I'm so happy. Um, and this is why we need to gather and be together. And at least we can do it a little bit through this the Zoom um, network, I would be nicer to be in person, but honestly, you're in Atlanta. If we didn't have Zoom, we wouldn't have been able to do this. So I'm trying to look on the bright side of Zoom. Oh no, this mm -hmm. is all blurry. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's kind mm -hmm. of... Um, sorry about that. Let yeah, me... it, it's just a similar, you know, like um, similar design. It's just, you know, taller. So it's. It, let's move on to the next one. Yeah, then. sorry about that. There we go. Okay, so now this one is um, the it's it's again it's a recessed lid. But then I asked myself a question like, what if I just put more, like uh, throw some other you know, um, 
round pieces and put them together. And this is how it came out. But then this shape kind of suggests it's more organic than my other functional work. It becomes almost sculptural. And so, and then um, I decided to put the eyes at the top and then they look a lot more organic. They look like they are the alien themselves. You know what I mean? Absolutely. The mm. whole thing is- the I alien. call this Curious Mind series. So my idea is like these eyes are kind of constantly observing the information and then gathering everything into the pot area. <laughs> it's very childlike, but you know. Uh, but it's, it's again, it's like, it's universal. It's a form that's playful and um, it's organic too. So I, I think you could, you can look at this and think it could have been made in 1960 or it could be made 20 years from now and it will still look very new. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Here's another version. Um, more eyes. So it's it's almost like um like you were saying, the whole pot is now kind of turning into the personality, it's not just the, mm -hmm. the image. Yeah. And then stop right there and then remember the lower part of this pot because mm -hmm. it's gonna have it, the later picture will show you. Is that a one after that? I think yeah. Yeah. You see that that becomes planter too. Right, so now you're evolving that form to be used for other things. Exactly. So that's that's the continuous process. It's con constantly evolving into something else. And this is why I really like pottery because you can do these things. Okay, like let's say um, a walk on canvas. It's kind of hard to evolve in into three dimensional areas. So, but then that, Pot pottery or the ceramics has more possibilities to me. Although it sells much cheaper than paintings. So. <laughs> I know, we're working on it. <laughs> ceramics is definitely having a moment in the art world. So, so and this, mm -hmm. you, you have a kind of a different approach to the um, glazed application in this one as well. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah. Um, this is just a, a yellow slip, porcelain slip. I like to use porcelain slip with different color, this mason stain mixed in. Mm. And then this one is glazed outside, but inside is, you know, because it's a plant pot. So inside is unglazed. Mm. And the pattern is much simpler because to me, plants should be the main focus, not the pot. Pots should just complement. It's This can go for the um, um, dinnerware too. So I, I don't do, yeah, I don't do complicated stuff for my dinner right? because the main focus should be what's on the plate, not the plate itself. Unless there are wall hanging plates, you know what I mean? Then it becomes piece of art. So that's that's the different approach. Um, and this one, this plant so beautifully sets off the form and really the whole thing becomes a piece of art together, I think. Mm -hmm. And then this is a collaboration too with a local planter. I mean, that, that plant shop, they're just so into exotic plants. And I didn't know that plant is such a thing right now. And then people collect planter, I mean, plant pots, but they do. But then um, I, I really enjoy this kind of collaboration. There's a local restaurant that I collaborate with. And then they're just as, as interesting too. Let me see if I can. I like that you can just grab stuff from your shelves. I know. <laughs> okay, so. Yeah, I'll stop the share so people can see you better. Okay, well, this is. There you go. Okay, so this is not really, this is not really, really working, but um, that's why it's here. But um, there's a local restaurant called Lazy Betty. It's like a um, high-end restaurant. And um, I make this appetizer server. Oh. It's, it's kind of, lid is supposed to sink in like that. So uh -huh. you can't really tell. 
but this one is defect, so that's why it's kept in here. But what it is, is a, a double layered appetizer server. Oh. So on the top surface, you have something. Uh -huh. And then when you open it, there's something else in there. Oh. Oh. So, and that's so an once again, the element of surprise that I like. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And it's now it fits. There you go. Mm -hmm. What a, and a new idea that the plate would have two surfaces. That's great. Mm -hmm. So, um, we'll go back. what were we talking about? Yeah. So, um, so, so that's that's the collabor collaboration that I really like to do. Yeah, collaborate and let the other when you do that, let the the plant or the food, you know, mm -hmm. shine. With, yeah, which is great. Um, so, oh, there it is, my Americano coffee cup. So this is just to show you a different, okay, the same design, but different shapes. Mm. Because, you know, like, this is what I learned from, like, going to art festivals. No matter what you make, people always want something else. <laughs> so, like, oh, if this cup was a little more smaller or a little more bigger. So I have these different shapes of cups so that uh, anyone no can really exactly no excuse for not buying something <laughs> yeah that's great i love this color and Thank this you. is more of a tea bowl mm -hmm. and the next one is like a more like 15 16 ounce mug which is i mean these are just yeah, this is this is probably the most popular shape now because mm -hmm. I, I guess people like a fairly large mug, right? With all these lattes and you know creamers on top and all this stuff that they like to do. I usually do better about this. I didn't bring my <laughs> um, my masa cup is downstairs in my cabinet. I meant to bring it up with me, but um, yes, it's one of the big ones. Yeah, I like a lot of milk. Oh, this one didn't come out either. Well, I just, yeah, I wanted the, to put this one in because of the, the reference to, um, you know, religion or, or other cultures. Was this intentional or is it just a, like a pattern that you liked? Well, um, you know, um, I'm not a religious person, but um, I, you know, if you grew up in Japan, the Buddhism is the major religion there. And then, you know, like, Growing up, growing up in my grandma's place a lot, I see a lot of Buddha images, so that's why I like that. Yeah. But uh, I will show you if you can. Yeah. Okay, here's a black one right here, right? Yeah. So now you see these numbers there, that mm -hmm. sort of like a you know DNA pattern or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> um, that has. 108 that's a sacred number in buddhism one for one thing zero for nothing eight for everything the construct of the universe so i thought that was a cool thing to put on that cut and then of course i use this a lot it's double happiness, double happiness. this chinese character in yellow right here is mm -hmm. read double happiness i saw a documentary called what the bleep do you know and the documentary talk about if you well this is um okay the documentary shows you the uh the segment of the documentary shows you that if you put like a positive word on the surface of the cup the water the content uh the crystallization of the water changes or something so it becomes like really um beautiful as opposed to if you put like ugly words on the surface of the cup, it, everything becomes deformed. So this is really pseudoscience. This is a Japanese scientist that, you know, uh, he said that's what it does, but I don't know if it does or not, but it doesn't matter because I like the concept of it. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm not a QAnon believer or anything like that, <laughs> but I, I, to my artistic preference, that kind of speaks to me. Yeah. And then I would like to, you know, if that, just in case, if it happens, I want my um, um, client to have a very good coffee in the morning if it changes the, uh, you know, shape of the water or something. Yeah, we we have to believe in the magic that makes <laughs> us happy, I think. Yeah. So, and then once again, this element of surprise, you see a little bird at mm -hmm. the end. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So that's like arrow. a little reward for drinking up your coffee. And the sort of arrow at the top of the handle points you into the to the bird in a way. Yeah. I like that. Oh, I like that too. I didn't think about that. <laughs> um, and the 018 is kind of interesting in um, Judaism. The number 18 mm -hmm. is a lucky number also. Oh, the, really? Like a good fortune. If someone mm -hmm. has a celebration, you give them $18 or a mm -hmm. multiple of 18 as a gift. So. Okay. See, uh, yeah, now um, these are small desktop flower pots that I used to make. And these shapes, you can go to the next one mm -hmm. and become salt sellers by having a cut, you know, okay. um, how, do you, how do you say that? Tangan group, making the tangan group to fit in that, you know, a salt cellar form. Yeah. And then you think what else you can do to that shape and then you come up with that candle holder. Absolutely. And then you mm -hmm. have all these a variations. Lot more candle holder. And then uh, that candle holder becomes candelabra. Oh, but I just want to, I want everyone mm -hmm. to notice, like you said, there's a surprise. You could just leave these plain, but they all have a little shape in them. You can see from mm -hmm. the top of the picture. Yeah, these are actually, yeah. And then, yeah, these are actually my virtuoso piece because they are not easy to make. They're all porcelain and they're very intricate. And to punch a hole at a certain period of time, that takes a lot of patience yeah. and they break frequently, as you can see. Yeah, and you have to punch a lot of holes. <laughs> oh, yes. And punching the hole leads me into these fruit ball. <laughs> So great. Yeah. Oh, was that all that we were going to look at? Um, I think Maybe so. I oh, no, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. yeah. So you saw those candles, small, you know, uh, tea light holders. And then I asked myself, what else can I, can I do? Oh, it could be a modern interpretation of candelabra. And then you make a towel out of those candle holders. There they and are. That one is, yeah. So great. Um, well, I think, yeah, I think that was all that we were gonna look at there. Mm -hmm. So we talked a lot about um, kind of, you know, how you evolved your work and your, how you got into clay and you talked about your inspiration, but are there any other things that you would like to share that are ways that you get inspired? Um, or, you know, what are you thinking thing. about next? All these changes mm -hmm. and evolutions. Well, um, but I don't force myself to do that. But uh, it's just, you know, just uh, by asking a certain questions, what, what else can I do to this? And then it, it's just, that's the motivating factor. You know, is that going to be interesting? Is that going to be stupid? Is it going to be wonderful? You know, let's see what it does. So that's, that's the approach. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have, have you found that during the pandemic, maybe this is a boring question that we keep asking, you know, mm -hmm. did, did it affect your art making where you, you know? Actually, it didn't. it didn't. I am so fortunate um, that a like, couple of years ago, I, 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 um, like, I put my basement into my art studio. That was the best decision ever. That was before pandemic. Mm -hmm. I didn't know it was going to happen. Nobody knew, right? Right. But if I moved everything. Well, we can go to my studio later. So oh, I yeah. can show it to you. But then the thing is, um, I am so grateful that I made that decision because mm -hmm. when the pandemic started, everything closed, right? Yeah. I, I would have nothing. I would not have a way to survive. But, but then I had all the time in the world to be making stuff then. So that was really... A wonderful thing yeah yeah that's great well that's a good segue can you show us your studio we would love to sure we have about let me minutes. um okay let's see let's see let me see yeah take your time all right now i have to um, everybody see me hold on i have to pin your other oh there we go um 
Okay. Are you okay? Yep. yep, we can see you. Okay, good. Let's see. How do I? Um... You should be able to flip it. Yeah, oh, there you go. Oh. That's oh, you have a little... sign on the door. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Just in case you forget. So this is my uh, humble little studio with my children here. Nice. And that's my porcelain station. Mm -hmm. This is my dark clay station. It's very important. I learned my lesson because if you only have one wheel and then yeah. two um, black and white clay, the mm. cleaning process is just crazy and then waste a lot of time. So I had to buy another one. Uh. So they're completely separated. I have a slab roller mm. and then you see the goldfish. Your snacks. <laughs> <laughs> you have to have snacks. That's my uh, dark clay table. And things are in making right now. Yeah. But cups. Jars. These are going to be garlic keepers. And then this is my uh, green, green wire that's dried. Mm. Yeah. You know, like the space is so limited, so they have to be multi purpose. Yeah. Yeah, so. that's great. You have so much in that, in that space, and you're just so well organized. Well, not really, but it's sometimes I see uh, like other potters' Instagram picture of their studios, and I'm amazed. <laughs> so oh, stylish. Wow. And then I can do my laundry here too. <laughs> I'm throwing. So this is my little studio. Oh, Do you okay. see anything particular? Like I noticed the teapot on your um. Mm -hmm. These are all my glazes. Oh, these teapots. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm. I'm uh, trying to experiment with um spout right now because I I want a spout that doesn't leak at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And much. then you can see my uh, candle jars here. They're bone dry now, and then all these sugar pots. And then these are the reject ones. Sometimes porcelain walk in mm. the kiln, in the mm -hmm. firing. So, yeah. and some bisquare at the top. What else is there to see? All these, my, um, these are my um, colored porcelain slip. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And then, so your glaze, um... Are you are you mixing your own glazes or? Um... Yes, I, I mix them. I, I buy the powders already pre-mixed and uh -huh. then I mix it at home. Mm -hmm. yeah. So. I don't know, it looks yeah. very, you've really used your space well. What a treat well, to you, get man. to see your studio, Masa. Thank you for showing us. Oh, you're welcome. It's, um, it's so special when we get to see people's personal spaces. Well, does anyone have questions while Moss is walking upstairs? Any, any, I'll look in the chat, but if you have any other questions, um, Suzanne wants to know if it's mainly underglaze and slip with clear glaze on top, or sometimes you don't put a clear glaze. No, I don't. Let's see. Is it, there, your work has that beautiful kind of um, matte surface often. Um, let's see. I, I have a glazing inside of the cup. Oh, you have to mute your other thing. Sorry. Oh, and I have to take your off spotlight off. Take the spotlight. There okay, we go. There. Okay, so where were we? Um, yeah, oh, the glaze. glaze. Yeah. 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 Um, pretty much all my porcelain stuff, porcelain work is all glazed, um, inside and out. But then, like the cup, like this. It's inside that's completely glazed, but outside is not. Mm. The where the lip touches, sometimes I glaze go over it, but otherwise they don't. Mm -hmm. um, but because um, I I tried, um, I tried clear glaze on top, and then the color washes, mm -hmm. and it becomes not as vibrant, vibrant as non glaze. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm Yeah. Um, Wendy wants to know what cone you fire to. Cone six. Um, and do you, are, is there a piece behind you that is like your favorite thing? 
<laughs> that we could be um, our, our last. But they're all, I mean, I think you've shown us a lot of great stuff already. So well. <laughs> well, um the favorite piece. I, I can show you like what I'm excited about now. Yeah. These are the wall hanging pieces oh, that yeah. I'm excited about. That's great. Because um when you hang stuff, they become more like paintings. You yeah. know what I mean? Absolutely. So I'm ex I'm excited about this direction. And um, of course, I'm really excited about this direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I have to make these. I would like to make a bigger pieces on those. But then what, what's consuming my time right now is the cups. They're just gone <laughs> constantly. So that's what I'm constantly making. Yeah. So, but then when that settles down, then I'm going to move on to, you know, more explore. I'm going to explore more. Yeah. Well, those are, those big ones are great too. So I can't wait to see where they go. And I just want to thank you so much. As usual, our hour just flew by and it's been so lovely to talk to you and hear about, um, all of the directions and the techniques and the ideas that you have. And um, I'll keep my eye out for the the DNA molecule or the coffee molecule on the cup. <laughs> You'll see that sometime. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so thank you, Masa. Have a lovely day. Everybody else, have a great day. Thanks for Thank you, everybody. Us. Have a we great have, day. Um, two more Lunch and Learns. And then we're gonna take a break while the move happens. So. Join us in the next couple of weeks and then I'll see you in the new building. Come visit us. Yeah. Yeah. Come visit Mama. Oh, Thank I would you. love to. Yes, we'll I will. Figure out a way. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. I will. Thank Great. you. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everybody.